Bob Whites used to be the number one game species in the United States across the eastern half of the country. In all three of the major ways that humans use the land, cropland, forest land, and grazing lands. But the way humans use the landscape has changed so fundamentally over the last 50 to 80 years that Bob Whites no longer are a product of the landscape like they used to be. Everybody's quail populations were going down together, down, down, down. And that's how the National Bob White Conservation Initiative was born, was 25 independent states coming together to collectively attack a problem that was bigger than any one of them individually. I could hear them in there. I heard them. They're, they're running that way. The ranges across the southeastern United States, including some 37 states. Uh, many of those states have seen declines in excess of 90%, 95%. So what we've seen is an extreme loss of the presence of this once common bird across the nation. Very steep declines in the eastern Texas or in our prairies where farming is pervasive, large agricultural farms and just forestry, all the same changes that have affected this bird and other portions of its range have affected them in Texas as well. Ever since 1985, the Farm Bill that Congress passed that year, for the first time a conservation title was included in that Farm Bill that provided incentives to farmers to install and establish conservation practices on their land. Every time they take a, a step, they're manipulating the soil, and then right where they manipulate the soil, you get some weed and forb growth, which creates seeds for quail. So cattle are, are a key wildlife tool if you use it correctly. More people now don't have to overgraze their property. And you're seeing, I think, actually more quail down in this country now than we saw 25 years ago. Because the, without the overgrazing, the, the quail are doing better. A lot of the uh, older farmers grew up with quail and were used to them and are really missing them now. Our sportsmen are very active in the state, uh, have a real priority on quail and quail habitat restoration. I move my cattle every day. Everybody thinks it's something new, but it's actually the way they did it in the 1800s. Smaller fields give grass a chance to rest between grazings. I think everybody tries to do the right thing. Uh, NRCS helped tremendously by helping fund some of this and giving me the know-how and the knowledge to do it. Uh, this is a cool season pasture, uh, predominantly fescue, tall fescue, a little bit of orchard grass. This is what you're gonna get across the landscape, heavily grazed. You'll see not a lot of cover for quail, grass and songbirds, not a lot of good habitat there. You know, what we saw on the other farm, the Peebler farm, was really the exact opposite. Some really good cover for wildlife. We uh, completely changed the landscape here at Shaker Village. Prior to 2009, it was just a cool season cattle pasture. We wanted more of a push towards uh, recreation and wildlife habitat. So we've got, uh, you know, over our 3,000 acres here at Shaker Village, we've got 1,200 in uh, active wildlife habitat management. So that's really something that we, we like to promote. I like to brag about it as much as possible. Our ultimate goal is we want high quality habitat on the landscape so that wildlife can thrive and also that the customers are happy too because when they're happy, they're gonna want more of it or to take care of it and that's what we need. The harvesting of trees is also a vital and integral part of managing a forest ecosystem, not, not just the extraction of products from the forest, but to create a forest that actually is beneficial for wildlife habitat. I'm in a uh, stand of loblolly pine that is uh, thickly grown. It was planted for commercial industrial forestry. There's millions of acres of this planted across the southeast. What we're looking for is to open this up to create a more open habitat for quail and other species. You've got to imagine the, the quail here on the ground when they when they bring their brood out and they're walking through, bugging through. I've got all these open, these open areas. I want a, a, a closed canopy so that they can be underneath so it's a lot harder for the predators to pick them off. Quail management with this open understory promotes food and habitat for 
all, all kind of species, including songbirds. So it's exciting when you go out and you've thinned and you've burned and you're starting to get that grass response and you're listening and well, one, you hear a Bob White, and then next you hear a Bachman Sparrow thing, and it's, I mean, that's when you know you've done something. By burning these fields off, we're gonna maintain them as that nesting cover that we really need for the birds. So the native grass that we're, we're putting in um, through the Conservation Reserve Program is going into uh, existing agricultural fields. And uh, we use that to provide a buffer between like the edges of these crop fields where we've got more trees and, and the actual crop. And what that's doing for us is it's providing diversity and, and that missing habitat component here. In some ways, uh, in Kansas, uh, our agriculture and conservation have actually paired very nicely. We've really added a lot of, of neat stuff on this property in the places where it'll do the most for soil and water conservation. You're finding a way to, to make wildlife habitat out of practices are also providing soil and water conservation. Absolutely. And that's the hardest thing when you're working with people who are trying to make a living off the land is getting them to do everything that is needed to make it all come together. We have the technical knowledge for how to restore bob white habitat. We know how to do it in croplands, we know how to do it on grazing lands, and we know how to make bob white habitat in forest lands. What we don't have is the clout to address the social and cultural parts of the problems, which is dealing with the people, dealing with the politics, and dealing with the money that it's gonna to take to change the way humans use land at a scale big enough to turn entire wildlife population trends in a more positive direction.